Um, I'm David Gurus. I'm the Harvick Planning Commission Chair, and this is a official meeting of the Harvick Planning Commission. Um, so I'm calling that to order right now. Uh, the entire meeting is going to be turned over to our consultant, Heather Carrington, who is helping us with our bylaw modernization. And this is an information session. So any comments, input, suggestions, um, we'd love to have them. And so Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. And to those of you who came out in person, thank you so much for being here. Glad to have you here. Um, my goal for tonight, really, I'll say again, I'm Heather Carrington. I'm the consultant who's been hired to work specifically with the Hardwick Planning Commission to amend the bylaws using funding through a using funding through a bylaw modernization grant. So that is through the Department of Housing and Community Development. And there's a small match with that, but if these bylaws are amended at the end of it, that is waived, so paid for by the state. Um, we're working with the zoning administrator as the project manager on the town end. So that's Kristen Leahy. So give a wave, Kristen, sitting on the floor over there. Um, so tonight what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through. We've been working on this project since April. That's when we kicked off. Um, so I'd like to walk you through some of the decisions that the Planning Commission has made to try to move forward some changes to the zoning to allow for more housing in the community. And as I'm sure you all know, there's quite a housing crisis in the state as a whole, and Hardwick is uh, really proactively trying to make changes to help more housing development happen here. So I'm going to start by running through what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, we've done introductions. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the project, the project goals. I gave you the funding source. Um, this isn't for the zoning for all of the town of Hardwick. There are specific areas that this is targeted to. Those areas specifically are areas that um, are prime for infill development. So there's existing infrastructure there. There's existing development there. So it's really about building on areas that are prepared for development, not about sprawling development outside of those areas. Um, and I'll show you those in a moment. Then I'm going to give you a brief, very brief overview of the Vermont Home Act, which comes into play with this project. Um, a look at Hardwick community housing plans and needs, so the goals for the community. And then we're going to dive into the specifics. So this is when we get into the technical, somewhat dry part, so bear with me when we get there. Um, and those are the, the specific bylaws that the Planning Commission has decided for to move forward, um, and I will be drafting those bylaws. Um, this is by no means the last time that you'll have a chance to give feedback. There's a series of public hearings that will be coming um, next year. Um, then I'm going to open it up so that I can hear from you. What are your concerns about this? What are you excited about? You know, what are things that we may have missed that you'd like us to be looking at? And then next steps and future opportunities for community input. So with that, I'm going to jump in. So as I had said, um, this is supported by a bylaw modernization grant from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And really, the state is looking to help communities to identify what are barriers to housing development in their communities and to remove some of those barriers. And there's quite a few resources that give us best practices for how to address this, and we are using those resources. Um, the amendments that are a result of this project should reflect smart growth principles. They should support the creation of additional housing units and they will target the housing development in Hardwick's designated downtown and in the designated village center of East Hardwick. Welcome. Please sign in. So this is the entire town of Hardwick, the town zoning. Hardwick has seven zoning districts, and it covers 39 square miles approximately. And then there's one flood hazard overlay district, which has become particularly relevant with recent events. We are not looking at the entire town. The geography we're looking at is in this red box, and I'm going to zoom in further so you can see specifically what we're looking at. So the districts that are being considered for bylaw changes are the Central Business District, Compact Residential District in purple, the Highway Mixed Use, which is in orange on this map, and Village Neighborhood, which is in the teal. Um, 
all together, the areas that we're looking at for changes covers about 6.5 square miles of the total of Hardwick's 39 square miles. So it's a relatively small portion of the town. But these are areas that are that already have infrastructure and would be um, the most common sense places for there to be new development. So as I had said, we started this project in April, um, and our whole plan was to really look at it through best practices uh, provided by the state, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, however, starting in June, uh, the state legislator, uh, the governor signed, enacted the HOME Act, which is Housing Opportunities Made for Everyone. It's Act 47. Um, and that contains a lot of statutory changes for municipal zoning that um, in residential districts that are served by municipal water and sewer. So basically the same areas that we were already looking at in our study. Um, so some, not all, of the changes that are required at the state level are limits to what municipalities can require for the number of parking spaces uh, per residential unit. Uh, it requires that multifamily buildings are an allowable use in all of the areas that are zoned for residential. So if you can have a single family home in an area in that same district, you need to be able to have up to a multifamily unit with four units in it, a multifamily building with four units in it. Um, it sets building and lot standards for residential units. Uh, the HOME Act also establishes emergency shelters as a protected public use and places limits on what municipal bylaws can regulate in relation to that. And in addition, allows a 40% density bonus and a one floor building height bonus for affordable housing development. So given that this has happened while Hardwick was already in the process of amending bylaws, we are adding that right into the mix and bringing it into alignment. Um, you know, these. Many of these changes through the HOME Act are already in place, and so your zoning administrator currently has to weigh all of this in approving or not approving a permit. So having your bylaws reflect that accordingly will make a lot of sense and put you ahead of the curve. So I had talked about the way that we've been, we were planning on approaching the project prior to the HOME Act, and that was to use a publication that was put out by the Department of Housing and Community Development, Enabling Better Places, a zoning guide for Vermont neighborhoods, but it's commonly referred to among um, housing people as zoning for great neighborhoods. We're calling it Z4GN, um, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, um, there are six main topics for reform that are covered uh, under in this document. And I put up a link to that document on the slide just in case people are interested in looking at it further and reading through and kind of learning a little bit more. But these are really areas that can serve as either uh, barriers to housing development or with changes can actually encourage housing development in communities. And those six key, key topics, and we're going to come back to these, are dimensional requirements, parking standards, standards, allowable uses, street standards, accessory dwelling units, and the development review process. And based on the slide I showed you about the HOME Act, you'll see that some of these were just done at a state level. They were just mandated at a state level so that some of those barriers are removed across the state. So this project aligns with Hardwick's goals um, from the 2019 Hardwick Municipal Plan. Many of you would know it as the town plan. Um, the goal is for Hardwick to have safe and affordable housing available in a variety of types for all incomes, ages, and for those with special needs. And there are a series of policies associated with that as well. Um, it's a pretty loose goal, um, not, not as specific as it could be, but it definitely covers all of the things that we're trying to do here. I'm going to give you a brief snapshot. Um, there isn't a housing needs assessment done for the town of Hardwick, but I was able to compile some data from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, housingdata.org site. Um, and they keep pretty up-to-date data there. Um, so everything that I'm showing you here is compiled from the 2021 uh, US Census American Community Survey data. Um, and they update that regularly, and that should be updated. And we'll get new data in December, and I assume they'll update their data probably in January, February of next year. But for now, um, 
Basically, Hardwick has 1,224 households, roughly. You know, keep in mind that census data can have uh, some room for error, and especially when it's based on American Community Survey, which is really just taking a selection. It's not a complete decennial census, but it's uh, taking some selected target population and um, going from there. Uh, homeless individuals, we do not have a, a point in time count for Hardwick itself, but for the county it was 139 people. Medium house, median household income in Hardwick is slightly lower than that of Vermont as a whole at $61,116. We have some good news and bad news on this slide. Uh, median primary home sale price in Hardwick is much less expensive than Vermont as a whole. So $180,000 in Hardwick versus $309,000 for Vermont as a whole. So that's great news. You are not in the range of extraordinarily unaffordable. Um, at the same time, the median year that homes were built in Hardwick is 1963 as opposed to Vermont's 1975. Um, that's an older housing stock and with that can come problems um, in terms of the quality of the housing, in terms of the safety and health features of the, quality of the housing, in terms of energy efficiency. So it can create costs as well. Um, median gross rent is much less expensive in Hardwick than Vermont as a whole, so $647 per month median gross rent in Hardwick versus $1,070 in Vermont. And I will anecdotally tell you that I live in Winooski and it's much, much higher there. Um, so, so good news on that one. Again, not completely unaffordable, but there are also the, you know, the, there's the lower median household income as well. The percent of households that, that would be considered severely cost burdened in Hardwick is much lower than that of Vermont as a whole. It's 2% in Hardwick, 14% in Vermont as a whole. Uh, the median household income in Hardwick as compared with the county is actually higher than the county overall. It's 110% of the county area median. Um, and another piece of bad news here, uh, increase in households, so the new starts, uh, the new house, households coming into Hardwick is much lower than that for Vermont as a whole. So we are very timely in trying to address this issue. Some of the housing gaps that have been identified in Hardwick are missing middle, so that would be affordable housing options for people who are earning anywhere from 80 to 120 percent of area median income. The variety of housing types isn't there so much as I would like to see it. 76 percent of homes in Hardwick are single family dwellings, so there's a gap in multiple other types of housing. Um, Gap in single family attached homes, so townhouses, row houses, things like that. Uh, there are fewer two, three, and four family dwellings than the state average overall. So um, I think that in part with the Home Act changes and allowing multifamily uses uh, on the same proper, in the same areas where you have single family, we'll start to address that. Um, but we've made some additional changes. Newer homes are a gap in Hardwick, and you saw that from the median year built. So 57% of Hardwick's housing stock was constructed prior to 1970. And as I was saying, newer homes can help with affordability, durability, health, and safety. Housing in Hardwick is substantially older than housing in the state as a whole. Smaller bedroom counts are uh, one of the trends that is are really missing here in Hardwick. 63% of homes in Hardwick have three or more bedrooms, while 68% of households are comprised of two or fewer people. So that kind of a mismatch between the population and the housing stock can make housing less affordable by forcing people to buy more than what they need or rent more than what they need. And lastly, flood safe housing. So new housing should be located outside flood hazard areas as much as is possible. And we will certainly be thinking about that throughout this process. So again, here are the six key topics for reform that the Planning Commission has been considering. And the way that we're doing it is we're crosswalking every recommendation in that uh, Zoning for Great Neighborhoods publication. Um, and under each of these, there are several specific recommendations for policy changes. So we crosswalk that with the bylaw as it currently stands. 
to look and see if it meets those recommendations. If it doesn't, then we start looking, digging into those more deeply. So we have this really nice Excel spreadsheet that we look at every time we address one of the districts. Um, and it, it just highlights areas that might want to be considered for further analysis. All right, now we're in the really, really super dry, boring part, so please bear with me. Um, but I wanna be as specific as possible so you're aware of the guidance that I've received from the Planning Commission and what I've been tasked with drafting, and then we'll come back to the Planning Commission for their review, and then we'll move forward with a public hearing process after that. So that's all next year. Um, so dimensional requirements. One of the recommendations is to make sure that you are matching the requirement that you have for minimum lot size to the local pattern in the district. And when I did an analysis, I you know, ran all of the districts through GIS software and looked at what exists there. Um, in some cases, there were areas where up to 43% of parcels didn't meet the bylaw standards, which then means that you're holding you're holding properties to a higher standard than is actually what pre-exists in the area. And what that does is that creates non-conforming properties. And non-conforming properties then can require a higher level of permitting. So that can mean that they have to go through a development review board process as opposed to a zoning administrator administrative permit. And what that does with housing projects is Anything that delays and makes the process longer uh, makes it more expensive. And anything that requires more soft costs, so for example, you might need to have some engineering studies done, you might need to have an architect present, you might need to have a landscape architect involved. All of those soft costs add up very quickly, and so they can make housing less affordable. So making sure that we're not holding new development to higher minimum lot sizes than what's actually there can help with housing affordability. So specifically, um, the guidance I've received is to reduce the minimum lot size in the village neighborhood, class one, two, and three, and the classes are uh, based on what municipal infrastructure is there. So if there's both water and sewer on a parcel, it's class one. If it's either water or sewer, it's class two, and class three is neither. Town, water. Uh, oh, did I, what did I say? You said water or sewer, just, I'm just clarifying. Oh yeah, town, yeah. yes, thank you. Um, so to reduce the minimum lot size from 7,500 square feet to 5,000 square feet in the draft version of the bylaw, um, and that would get it to an 86% parcel conformity. What we didn't do is go to 100% parcel conformity um, with the bylaws, just because there are some parcels that are so small and so strange, you know, there are these weird little parcels all over the place, that if you did that, you would have minimum lot sizes that are ridiculously small. So we did the best that we could, the highest possible percentage of conformity that we could do that was reasonable. Um, they've also instructed me to reduce the minimum lot size in the compact residential class one zoning district from 10,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. So both of these going down to 5,000 square feet. Um, so that would align those two with each other. Reduce the minimum lot size in the compact residential. This is the wrong, oh, class two, I'm sorry. Um, to reduce the minimum lot size in compact residential class two zoning district from 20,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. And the reason for that is because if you don't have both municipal water and sewer, and what we have is mostly parcels that have municipal water but not sewer, you do, do need to have the space to set up septic. So those need to be bigger lots in order to do that and meet all the requirements for the septic. Reduce the minimum lot size in the highway mixed use, class one, two, and three zoning district from 20,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet in the draft version, and that would create 72% parcel conformity. And to reduce the existing small lot, which is just a separate section in the bylaw, um, minimum lot size required to 5,000 square feet. It had been over that, and so we were holding small lots to a larger standard than many of these other districts, so that was just to align. Um, another issue with 
dimensional requirements is other dimensional standards. And one of those that particularly came into play here was the frontage required. So if you've taken something from a 20,000 square foot lot requirement uh, down to 5,000 square feet, and you don't change the frontage on that, you end up with really strange, long, shallow <laughs> parcels. <laughs> so, so we also looked at these um, and to make sure that they align also with what's in the districts. And again, I looked at what the parcel conformity was um, and, and tried to improve that. So what is being proposed is to reduce the minimum frontage in the central business zoning district from 50 feet to 25 feet, which is very narrow. Um, and I do want to stress that the required minimum doesn't mean that everything is changing to that. It means it is the absolute least that a developer can get away with in doing a new project. So, um, and that aligns with, um, at the state level, there's a requirement for at least 20 feet of um, road access in order to develop a parcel. So that can be done with an easement or that can be direct access to the street. What do you need, babe? We found them. Nancy. Nancy's not on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nancy. You're you're not on mute. So we're we're having a conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, so the next is to reduce the minimum frontage in the highway mixed-use zoning district from 100 feet to 65 feet and to reduce the minimum frontage in the village neighborhood zoning district from 70 feet to 50 feet. And lastly, to reduce the minimum frontage in the compact residential class one, two, and three zoning districts to 50 feet in the draft version of the bylaw. Um, under dimensional requirements, there is also a recommendation to reduce density cap requirements. And the recommendation in zoning for great neighborhoods is to, if possible, just eliminate them completely. We did not go all the way to eliminate them completely, but tried to look at with the changed dimensional requirements for the minimum lot size and frontage, what did that mean in terms of the density that needed to be allowed on parcels in order to align with the HOME Act? So because density caps are the amount of square footage that it, in this bylaw, it's the amount of square footage that is required on a parcel per unit built, we needed to take a close look at this in order to make sure that every one of the parcels that we're creating with those changed minimum lot sizes would allow for four housing units. Um, so that, that it immediately, pulling one lever, pulls a bunch of other levers, as you can see from the frontage and now the density cap requirements. So we looked at those really carefully to make sure that those would allow for the four units that are required by the state statute. So the recommendation is to reduce minimum lot area per unit in the village neighborhood class two and three zoning districts from one per 7,500 square feet to one per 3,500 square feet in the draft to reduce minimum lot area per unit in the highway mixed use class one zoning district from one per 5,000 square feet to one per 1,250 square feet in the draft version. So those would make that align. Oh, and very abruptly we jump out of the recommendations for dimensional standards. Um, Kristen, do you think we should stop and take questions as yes? Okay. So I'll stop there and ask if anyone has questions, because that was a lot to go over and technical dry stuff. So OK, then I'm going to plunge right into parking, which is much easier and more straightforward. Um, so this has basically been taken out of municipal hands at this point, because the state statute says that we cannot set in municipal bylaws a requirement of any more than one parking space per residential unit for all residential units, again, within those districts uh, that are served by municipal infrastructure, um, regardless of the parcel class. Um, what the Planning Commission decided to do this regardless of the parcel class um, within these districts. So that aligns the requirement, so it's straightforward, it's clear, 
it's consistent, and it's easy for people who are looking to develop housing to understand. Uh, there's not a complex calculation depending on where you are in one of these districts. If you're in one of these districts, it's one space per residential unit. Allowable uses is the third of the key topics. Um, so in many districts throughout the state, um, it's been pretty standard to allow for uh, single family homes, but not anything else. Um, so that really limits the type of housing and the amount of density that can be achieved and creates a supply issue across the state. Um, so with the HOME Act, there is a requirement that by right, if you are in a district that allows residential housing, you, can, you must allow up to four units. So we followed that recommendation and are just implementing the HOME Act as we go. So uh, the Planning Commission has voted to have me draft language that would move single family dwelling, two family dwelling, and multifamily dwelling from a conditional use, which might have to, would have to go through a development review board process, which I talked about earlier as increasing cost, um, in the central business zoning district, um, just to an allowable use. So by right, that is a use that can be um, developed in that area. To move multifamily dwellings from conditional use to allowable use in the village neighborhood, class one, two, and three, um, single family was already allowable there. To move multifamily dwelling from conditional use to allowable use in the compact residential zone, again, that was single families were allowed there and um, two families were allowed there as well. And to move multifamily dwelling from conditional use to allowable use in the highway mixed use zoning district. Class one, two, and three. I'm going to stop again, ask if there are any questions on that. So what, what is the highway mixed use? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll jump back up. So bear with me as I jump back up to the map. I probably should have put it right in there, but um, highway mixed use is the orange on this map. So it goes, you know, out the main arteries, and also there's an area that is in East Hardwick that is the highway. So there's the areas where I'm like 14, 15. Huh? Yep, that's right. That's right. Okay, um, next up is street standards. So ensuring that you have connected streets, ensuring that you have sidewalks, that you have bike ped facilities, um, makes it easier for people to work and live in the same area without having to have a vehicle. Um, and it certainly increases quality of life. So um, where feasible, implementing complete streets to support pedestrian and cyclist connectivity is the one of the recommendations that we looked at. Now, understanding that in Hardwick, there are not endless funds to be putting sidewalks to everywhere. Um, the recommendation that I made and that the Planning Commission agreed with is that that should be done strategically and incrementally over time, with starting with Central Business District and connecting that up entirely, then moving to the village centers, connecting those up entirely, you know, as money becomes available. And there are a wide variety of grant programs at the state level that can assist with this. Um, so I think not requiring complete streets in every area is probably the strategic move right now because that could end up being a barrier to new housing development and I think we really need to be moving forward with the housing development. But having an intention of how approaching complete streets should be part of the plan. The fifth uh, ish topic for consideration is accessory dwelling units. And this one's easy because Hardwick already took care of this. Accessory dwelling units are allowable all over the place in the town. Um, they were very careful. The Planning Commission was very careful about ensuring that that was in the bylaws. So we don't need to make any changes here. And the last is the development review process. So reduce requirements for conditional use approval and site plan review and simplify the application process. Um, so again, we're talking about people having to be shuttled through a development review process and that sets up a situation where, you know, there's a possibility for bias, there's a subjectivity in that process, um, and it certainly costs more and takes longer. 
So um, I am happy to say that by making all the changes with the allowable uses, that pretty much moves much of the housing out of a conditional uh, review, uh, development review process. Um, so having it be by right does a lot of this for us. Um, we have looked at requirements. The requirements are not overly onerous in Hardwick. They're pretty standard and pretty appropriate. So there were no major changes there. Um, I've looked over the application. Um, pretty straightforward. We will continue to have an eye on that as we go forward with the process, but as of right now, that's not really where the changes need to be made. Um, it was really pulling housing out of necessarily going into the development review process because it wasn't an allowable use. Okay, here's all the weird various little changes that as I was reading through the bylaw, um, came to my awareness, and, and many of them are about complying with the HOME Act. So uh, one is to add an exemption to the maximum building height standard to allow for a bonus story for affordable housing um, that's required by the HOME Act. To reduce the minimum lot area per mobile home in a mobile home park from 6,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet to align with the requirements for other housing types so we're not holding mobile homes to a higher standard than other homes. To remove the requirement that mobile home parks have a 25-foot landscape buffer around the entire perimeter of a mobile home park. Um, this was, again, a higher standard that was being used on one housing type versus other housing types. Um, so that wasn't exactly in compliance with fair housing principles. To remove the requirement that mobile home parks have a minimum of 100 square feet of indoor storage for each mobile home in the park. Again, we're not doing that for any other housing type. Um, so getting rid of anything that could be read as you know, not being fair housing friendly. And to add temporary shelters to the protected public uses included in the bylaw. And that, again, is required by the state statute. Wow, I went through that really, really quickly. So, <laughs> so I'm going to stop there. I know it's a lot that I just covered, um, but I'd like to open it up to your questions, your housing concerns, um, any point that was a burning issue that brought you here tonight to talk about housing. No burning issues. None. <laughs> are, do you feel that the Planning Commission is generally getting it right here? Are we, are we moving in the right direction? Are you, are, is there anyone sitting here with me and they're like, no, wrong direction entirely? I have a question. Sure. I was wondering if you could talk more about accessory dwelling units and what qualifies as an accessory dwelling unit versus an RV or mobile home and what restrictions there are on those. I'm going to defer to Kristen on that, who is the zoning administrator here. So the way that is being interpreted, and I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, no, no, but I, quite all right. I think it's appropriate for you to take that one. Um, so an accessory dwelling unit, we don't have a requirement for, and you're going down on the floor to get to the orange so <laughs> There's a chair. There's a chair right here. That's OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, accessory dwelling units, we don't have a requirement as far as whether they're detached or attached. They can, it's, they have a 900 square feet. It's the size uh, requirement. Um, they do have to be connected to wastewater and water, potable water. So either town systems or your own, if you're in a district that doesn't have town water and town sewer. Um, we don't require a certain amount of bedrooms or what is in the actual accessory dwelling unit, but we do require that the owner of the property either has to be in the accessory dwelling unit or in the, the principal house or section. Um, it is a permitted process, so you come to the zoning office or you submit a zoning permit and you'll receive, if everything checks out, 15 days later you have your permit. If you have more questions, I'm here most morning. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. There are a lot of resources also um, at the state level. If you go through uh, 
there are a variety of places, but Department of Housing and Community Development, um, they have resources to help people with creating ADUs if they're interested in that. So, I have one more question. Sure. Um, so an ADU, can that be used as an Airbnb? It can. There is no restriction on it That's as used. far as the use. But okay. you do have to have, if it's going to be an Airbnb, you have to, as the landowner, you have to be living in the other section. Mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't, at this time, Hardwick does not have an issue with Airbnb. Mm -hmm. I think we have 15, either Verbo or Airbnb. Mm -hmm. We're not. So we're not at the same place as a Morrisville or Stowe or any of the other towns that mm -hmm. we hear about consistently. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Short-term rental. That's yes. the technical term for them. Go ahead. How do the multifamily dwelling units work when I think, it, I can't remember the numbers for sure, but I think it was like one unit um, for 3,500 square feet and a minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet or some, I'm probably getting those wrong, but can you explain how a multifamily dwelling works in the residential area with the new proposed minimum uh, lot sizes and unit sizes? So we reduced the density caps So in each of those cases. So if we had just reduced the lot, it wouldn't. Um, but we reduced the uh, density cap requirements so that they would each allow the four. So we, we did the calculation of what this has to be, what this number has to be in order to fit it onto this parcel. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if we hadn't thought about that, we would be creating a real conundrum for ourselves. But, yeah. Planning Commission, any thoughts you want to add to that? Anything that you feel is important for people to know about the process? Um, one thing is just so you know, this is not set in stone. This is still in a draft phase of discussion. So we're seeking input, comments, questions, uh, suggestions, um, and eventually uh, we'll turn, take all that and have, we'll turn it over to Heather. And Heather will craft the proposal <coughs> language, and then we'll have um, public hearings on that. With the specific language. And then people can come in and say, um, I think it should be one foot less or whatever it is, and we'll consider it. And once the uh, Planning Commission has had the public hearings and uh, vote to um, make perhaps make amendments or changes and has a final version, we turn it over to the select board and the process kind of starts again where they'll have a public hearing on it so that'll be another chance to go through and the select board will be able to um, have the final say in the version that they would vote on. Yep, that's right. And you'll see on the slide that I surprised myself with because I didn't realize I was going through it so quickly. Um, the next steps and engagement opportunities, you have kind of a timeline of that. So um, I will be delivering the draft language. So now I've received from the Planning Commission their decisions about all of the different areas that we were looking at, and I will spend the winter months drafting. And then um, I'll deliver that to them in March. And so um, there will be a discussion of those draft bylaw amendments where the Planning Commission has that chance to say, whoa, 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 this isn't exactly what we intended. You know, we can, we can shift that. That's March 12th, 2024. Um, and then April 9th at the Planning Commission meeting. And again, that's here, 6.30 PM. It's a regular schedule. Um, They'll discuss the revised draft bylaw amendments. Uh, May and June, I intend for the Planning Commission to be holding public hearings on those, so be looking for that. And then September and October, the select board public hearings, if everything goes according to plan. And so we should be done with this process December of next year. It's a long, slow process, but that's because it's really important to have all of those checks, all of those steps, checking in with the community and making sure that we're doing what the community desires and what the state requires. 
Go ahead. Do you have any example communities of where bylaws like this have been implemented and the changes have um, resulted in what you're hoping for? I do. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I said earlier that I live in Winooski. And um, one of the, Winooski has been outperforming all of Chittenden County for creating housing and affordable housing specifically. And one of the reasons for that is it's not this specific bylaw set of changes, but um, Winooski implemented form-based code. Uh, so form-based code really sets up, here's what the envelope of the building needs to look like, here's how far it needs to be set back from the street, and here's you know the amount of lot coverage, but it doesn't tell you what you can do within that. So you can have as many housing units as you want. And so, you know, Winooski now over since 2016, um, it's put in hundreds of new housing units and the affordability rate, I, I used to work for the city also. Um, so I was the community and economic development officer. So I tracked housing and ran housing kind of programming there. Um, and it was the only community in Chittenden County that was meeting the goals of this building homes together plan that the county has. It was meeting not only the production goals, but also the affordability goals. And that was based on the zoning that was put in. That was very much part of it, was the zoning. Thanks. You're welcome. Go ahead. Is there some place we can access this to kind of look at it more closely? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to have this up on our, Jerry, hi, we'll have this up on the town website, okay. um, on the zoning page and on the planning commission page. And if you signed in and left your email address, I will email you the PDF as well. Okay. Okay. I'll add my email then. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, is the planning commission looking at the um, any bylaws around short term rentals or is that like not a I think there's a broad, I mean, I'll speak for myself and say that there is a broader conversation to be had as a community. Like you have to have a vision for what it is you would like to see happen from a community perspective prior to writing regulation. And, and I think there's, and, and there's also a broader conversation that's going on at the state level. Um, you know, a lot of concern about that and some communities have implemented you know, some regulations around that, but I don't know that Hardwick is there yet, and, and I don't know that it's the threat in the community, which it, it could potentially become, or, you know, I, I, I don't know we're at the point where you could do that yet. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, does that really stave off Future. Yeah, yeah, and it's good, to be, it's good to be thinking about that, and I think that, you know, that is something that should be considered. Um, but I, I don't know that we're at the place where we know what we want to accomplish with that yet. Tracy. So um, just thinking about the Homes Act coming out of this last legislative session and seeing what the, some of the governor's statements have been around, what he wants to see happen with Act 250 and other things going forward, do you anticipate some additional legislation coming out of the next session that will... Um, we're not going to have to go back to the drawing board, are we? I don't think so. I, I think in turn, I think that you know this was the big push that was going to be about specifically requiring municipalities regulations okay. um, to change, and then I do think there's obviously there has been an ongoing conversation about Act 250 for years, mm -hmm. um, and and I think that will continue to be an ongoing conversation. And I think it also really differs from community to community. You know, mm -hmm. there are communities in Vermont that don't have zoning and they don't have professional planning staff and they don't, you know, so, so there are protections in Act 250 that really matter in some towns and then it's applied uniformly across the board and I, I'm hoping that there will be some movement that will be common sense movement. So, for example, I, I gave testimony about city of Winooski okay. And, you know, and said, listen, we have zoning, we have professional staff, right. you know, we have capacity to be doing this ourselves, and this doesn't need to be a duplicative and expensive process. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the, it's all designated, you know, it's downtown development area, you know, so it, there's no reason for it there. But there are very much communities where there is a reason for it. So, yeah. But I don't think that they're going to say, 
oh, also we forgot this and one municipal be regulation. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I mean, mean, we love to, but <laughs> who knows? But okay. but I doubt it. Okay. Thanks. I wondered. Yeah. Just to jump in on that, it's not unusual that the state will come up with one thing and we'll have to go in and say, what do you know? We're not complying and we'll fold that into a couple other things, yep. adjustments we've made, and we'll have a minor adjustment hearing, and we'll go through the same process um, without the consultant, <laughs> so therefore it moves along a little quicker. But Not we do that, though, we, we commonly uh, make modifications to the uh, bylaws. Every yeah, that's part year, of your purview. Pretty much, yeah. 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 So we fold that in. Other questions, comments? Kristen, anything I'm missing? I don't. Well, that was probably the most. But I, I, you should do your, your, your examples. Oh, my, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kristen took some photos for me that I had asked her to take, and so I am not highlighting them appropriately, and I really want to show you some stuff here. <laughs> so um, I went through, when I was doing my analysis of the lot sizes, um, I identified parcels in that currently don't meet the dimensional standards um, so that you have a sense of what those are. So in the central business district, um, both buildings that you see here, are they don't have the minimum lot size required. But as you can see, um, you know, what is now the flower basket, and please don't quote me on this, this is not something that is in the works or anything like that. This is just an example I'm coming up with off the top of my head. Um, you know, you could really be building a lot more there even though it's too small a parcel, you know, and it would align with the other buildings in the area. Um, so it's not unreasonable for us to be reducing that a little bit so it better aligns with what exists. Same thing here. Um, the, there are three or four houses in this area on Lower Cherry Street that these don't, these aren't large enough lots for what is the minimum requirement there, but still perfectly comfortable and at home in this area. So we're not creating changes that are going to change the, the character of the neighborhood. We're creating changes that really make more of the make it more what is already there. Same thing here, Village Neighborhood, West Church Street, these are all under minimum lot size. Compact Residential District, these are non-conforming under minimum lot size. So, you know, when you have in certain areas of the town 42, 43% of parcels that don't meet your own bylaws, then the bylaw is wrong. And so you need to <laughs> shift the bylaw. Yeah. Highway mixed use, um, these are under minimum lot size, and you can see there's tons of space here. Um, so. And that's it. Those are the photos taken by I Kristen. Was not, I was not. I was not. I was showing the photos. I just think they're really exempt. They're good examples. Yeah. They. Yeah. I mean, it's it's important to have the examples. Absolutely. And I always forget that I have them there. And I just think I'll use them as reference if I need them. But so you all have a sense of you know what we're talking about. All right. Then I am going to turn it back over to the planning commission um, to adjourn your meeting if that's sure. where you are. Okay. Um, if there's any other comments from the public since you're all here that you'd like to share with the Planning Commission or express, this would be a great opportunity. And of course, you're welcome to come to future Planning Commission meetings. Yeah, it only costs a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we'd love to have it. But, uh, um, or obviously any communication you like to send to us or through Kristen is great and we love the input, feedback, anything. Um, and our agendas are posted, obviously. Um, but hearing nothing, um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. We're out of here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being here.